Okay, so uh, our last speaker talking about uh, methodologies commonly used in cancer research is uh, James Marvin. James Marvin is the manager of the Cancer Center uh, well, cytometry facility, which is very heavily used by uh, members of the Cancer Center, and he's going to describe to you uh, what flow cytometry, how flow cytometry is used in, in cancer research. So, thanks. thanks. Well, good afternoon. Um, so, I'm basically here to give you just about enough information about flow cytometric analysis to be dangerous. Um, this is typically, you know, a presentation that's 60, 70 slides with a whole bunch of information. Um, some of it which puts people to sleep, but um, most of it is good information. I've trimmed it down to about 20 slides. So a lot of the nitty-gritty detail about, you know, proper experimental design, all that kind of stuff we're skipping. This is just a, a general overview of flow cytometry. Um, so this is uh, what a flow cytometer looks like. Um, they're normally just black or just big boxes. This hood is normally going to be down closed. So it's literally just going to be a big box when you walk in. Um, right here, um, there's three different lasers on this instrument. And then the detectors for the fluorescent signal is um, kind of a trigon, an octagon, and a trigon over here. You have fiber optic delivery of the fluorescent signal into these detectors. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these, is, what the, what these different detectors and lasers are. But I just wanted to kind of show you if you ever do see a flow cytometer, this is generally what it's going to look like. So this is a paper from uh, Mario Roterer, um, actually in 2004 from Nature Reviews. Um, so flow cytometry kind of like limped along for a couple of decades after it was discovered um, and being utilized. And so this paper is actually looking at um, 17 different parameters, um, looking at all kinds of different immunes. So he's a big HIV investigator. So he's obviously looking at um, T cell subsets. Um, so what he's doing is basically, sub if you've never seen a flow cytometer plot, this is basically what it's going to look like. So you essentially are looking at each one of these little dots in this plot is going to be a cell with a certain amount of intensity. So a cell that's right here is going to have this much CD4 intensity. A cell that's right here is going to have this much CD8 intensity and obviously this much CD4 intensity. So through some uh, gating strategies that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, he then took the CD8 cells and brought them to a different um, plot, now looking at CD8 versus CD45RO. Uh, Similarly, CD4 cells are brought over here, same plot. And then we're looking at the um, secretion of IL2 or interferon gamma in each of these different subsets. Um, so the science isn't that important here. It's just the fact that um, basically in one tube, you have the ability to pull out one, two, three, four, you know, all these different populations um, within your um, immune system. So there's kind of like a, a running joke within the, the nerdy flow cytometry community, but it's, it's really becoming possible to design an experiment um, and give a graduate student one tube with, say, like 20 different parameters in it, and he can spend the rest of his career basically analyzing the data within that tube. Um, you can imagine um, just adding, you know, one more parameter to this analysis here significantly increases the subsets of populations that are visible. Um, so I, excuse me if this is just a little too cartoonish for you, but I just, I had no idea what kind of um, experience and audience we we're going to have today. But essentially this is what happens in a flow cytometer. You have a tube with a whole bunch of different cells in it, a very heterogeneous mixture of, of cells. Um, next thing you're going to do is you're going to take some kind of fluorescently labeled either antibody or a fluorescent dye. Um, all different kinds of colors that you can separate. You dump that into the tube. And now you have that same tube of cells that are all labeled differently depending on what kind of cells they are. Introduce the flow cytometer. So you, um, you take your tube of cells, you suck it into the instrument, and then you basically spit it out across a laser. And then as the cells cross that laser, you have um, scattered light in the forward direction. And then you have scattered light in kind of the side direction. Um, and then all of those values are kind of given a, a digital value that, they, they, that you then um, graph out. So a very, very big overview of kind of what a flow cytometer is. Um, so a little bit more background on flow cytometry. Um, it's, it's very similar to microscopy, just to kind of give you a visual of, of kind of some of those similarities. You have um, essentially a, some type of illumination source or light source, so on a microscope, that's going to be a mercury arc lamp, typically. You can also have lasers, but 
um, something to illuminate the sample. On a flow cytometer, it's going to be, it's pretty much always some type of uh, monochromatic laser. It's going to be a 488 nanometer laser or a 638 nanometer laser. Um, some type of laser, though. So this is the cells coming down. This is the laser coming across. Um, next, you're going to have some type of specimen. So in a flow cytometer, it's going to be a single cell suspension. So obviously, this is very well suited for looking at um, hematopoietic cells, immune cells, because they're just naturally flowing around in your bloodstream already in a single cell suspension. But you can also take solid tumors, homogenize tho those up, and you have a single cell suspension also. Um, so on a microscope, obviously, that's just going to be mounted on some kind of slide. Um, both systems have some way of kind of deconvoluting your, your fluorescence intensity. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about this, but you have, you know, emission from your cell of a whole bunch of wavelengths, anywhere from, you know, UV up to um, um, infrared, and you have some way of separating those out so that you know that um, a cell is labeled with X, Y, or Z. Um, and a microscope does a similar type of thing. Um, you have some way of detecting that signal. That can either be a camera, um, mounted right here on the microscope, or it's going to be a pathologist or somebody's eye. Um, on a flow cytometer, they're called PMTs, photomultiplier tubes. That basically takes a, um, a photon, converts that to a photoelectron, which is essentially a then made into a voltage current, which is then enumerated. So five photons equals five um, electrons, which equals a digital value of five. Um, on this particular cell. The next cell has twice the amount of antibody, so it has twice the amount of photons emitted, so it has twice the amount of current being generated, and the digital value is twice the amount, it's 10. Um, so um, some, some correlations between microscopy and flow cytometry. Um, so if you look down here, um, I don't even know what this is staying with anymore, but um, this is essentially localization of antigen is very possible with microscopy. So you can kind of tell the brown um, tinge of the staining here is kind of on the extracellular environment, where on a flow cytometry plot, you have no idea really where um, that, that light is being, or that signal is coming from. So this cell right up here, or this, this um, population of cells has this amount of fluorescence in parameter one, this amount of fluorescence in parameter two, but you don't know if that's coming from the intracellular environment or the extracellular surface of the cells. Um, so poor enumeration of cell subtypes, um, you know, you can, a good pathologist, trained pathologist can tell the difference morphologically between a significant number of, you know, lymphoblasts versus a monocyte versus a neutrophil, whatever. Um, but essentially, they're limited in the amount of different cell subsets, cell subsets that they can actually determine, where a flow cytometer, um, very, very, very easy to kind of differentiate. Um, different cell sets. Here's one subtype. This would be single positive. This is another population that's single positive. This is double, pop, uh, double positive. Um, so yeah, that's basically the endpoint too. Limiting number of simultaneous measurements. You can look at n uh, number, very numerous parameters at once and in a very quick manner. I mean, typical flow cytometers these days are analyzing um, up to 70,000 events per second. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're used to looking at a microscope where you're straining your eyes counting, you know, 500 cells or something on a tripan blue exclusion, um, you know, this can do literally 70,000 events per second. So statistically, you're talking about very um, robust data. Um, okay, so this is kind of my one or maybe two text slides here. So what happens in a flow cytometer review, I guess? Um, cells in suspension flow single file. Um, past a focused laser where they, are, where they scatter light and emit fluorescence that is filtered and collected. Um, that value is then converted and digitized values that are stored in a file, which can then be analyzed on uh, specialized software. So you basically have fluidics, interrogation, electronics, and interpretation of the data. So uh, just a quick little summary of the fluidics. Like I said, it needs to be a single cell suspension, and the precision of your data comes from what's called um, hydrodynamic focusing and laminar flow. So if you can think of a laser coming across this interrogation spot right here, you have that tube of cells essentially over here. You pressurize those in a surrounding media of normally PBS or sheath fluid, and what it does is it takes that very diffuse population of cells and focuses them into the very, very, very tight spot. So now all of your cells are flowing perfectly down a, a nice tight line. 
um, which, that me which then means basically that every single one of your cells is hitting the exact same part of the laser and the variation of your data is, is very tight. Um, probably won't spend a ton of time on this. So basically, so in a photometer, I said you, you have lasers that basically excite the floor force. Um, you can also have um, a couple different measurements called forward and side scatter measurements, which are, which are not fluorescent components. They're actually just scattered light. So if you're using a 488 nanometer light, which is about that color, um, you actually hit the cells and that 488 nanometer light is, is scattered in the forward direction and it's also scattered um, in the side direction. So forward scatter um, and then also coming towards the audience essentially is the side scatter. And so why do we look at these? Um, so they're, they're kind of a measurement of, of morphology. So forward scatter is generally attributed to cell size, and side scatter is generally attributed to the kind of internal complexity or granularity of the cells. You can think of a sphere, um, and the more kind of things inside of that cell that are going to bounce light, that's going to increase your side scatter intensity. So this is just looking at um, lysed peripheral blood over here on the left. You have a little bit of... Um, very small red blood cells or debris. You have your lymphocytes and then your monocytes and your granulocytes. So these are basically four different populations that are easily identified just by looking at how cells scatter light. You're not looking at any fluorescent component. You don't need to stain with any, with any antibodies or any dyes. This is just how they kind of scatter light when you run a, um, cells across a laser. Another common uh, use for forward and side scatter is to just, if you're doing cell line work, just to, to discriminate the live and the dead cells. Typically, a live, this is a very typical profile for um, cell line work. You have a live cell population, and then you have a, typically a decreased forward scatter and an increased side scatter of your dying or apoptotic cells. That's number one, because they're gonna have a different refractive index. Um, so forward scatter, I said, was size, but it's also a measure of refractive index. So if you take a cell and puncture holes in it, all the extracellular environment is going to leak into the intracellular environment, and it's going to change your refractive index. So that is essentially oftentimes what's, what's decreasing your forward scatter signal. Um, another one of the apoptotic programs um, or characteristics of the apoptotic program or cell death is uh, increased chromatin condensation. So it kind of, um, that again is just going to lead to increased side scatter intensity, which is why they're shifted up a little bit from the, um, from the live cells. Um, so this is kind of just like a slide showing some very common fluorophores that are going to be used um, bound to different antibodies. Um, you have FITSI, PE, um, PERSI, PSI 5.5, and PSI 7. So typically, all of these are going to be excited with a 488 nanometer laser. And then you get emission of the FITSI around 530, the PE, PE around 588, 695 for this dye, and 780 for this dye. Um, so um, from that last slide, you can see that they're, well, actually, if I just back up a second, you can see that these actually, these emission profiles do overlap a little bit. So um, FITSI kind of fluoresces anywhere from like 490 all the way really up to about 600 and you know, 25 nanometers. So you need some way of actually separating out these signals. And the flow timer does that through dichroic filters. Um, so you can either have long pass or short pass filters. Um, they're essentially placed at 45 degrees from the incident light. Um, so essentially we have all of your, your colors coming across and it's hitting this dichroic filter. The red light is going into um, detector two and the yellow light is gonna go into detector one. So this is going to be all of your intensity with antibody stained with, say, FITSI, and this is all of your intensity with the antibody stained with, say, PE, and that's how you separate out these different signals. Um, so this is actually just an overview picture of our um, sorter down uh, in the Chicago campus. So essentially, your sample is being interrogated kind of on the bottom of the screen here, and the, all of the fluorescent components are coming back in this direction. So you can see that um, there's a, a mirror basically right here, sorry, right here, and all of the excitation from the blue laser is coming into this bank, and you have these series of dichroic filters placed at 45 degrees to separate all the different uh, fluorescent components. So you can look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 different fluorescent um, parameters essentially on this instrument. Um, so yeah, once we kind of have the, 
the photons converted into a digital value, essentially. We need some way of plotting that. Um, these are just kind of examples of all the same data just presented in different ways. This is your typical kind of topographical map contour plot here, um, where it's really nice to see kind of the peaks and the valleys in between these different populations. This is just a density plot where essentially the more and more cells in a particular region will um, change the, the color of that particular region. Grayscale, dot plot, and a histogram. Um, so yeah, the, the histogram, sorry, it's just, it, it's a one parameter plot. All of these are plotting, you know, two parameters. It's parameter X versus parameter Y. Um, and the histogram is just a one parameter plot. So gating is, uh, is, is one of the most valuable tools in flow cytometry. Um, it's used to isolate a subset of cells on a plot. Um, it allows the ability to look at parameters specific only to that subset. Um, and it can be, eh, we'll skip that. So essentially this is a, a stem cell assay. Um, it's called the side population analysis. So what you do is you take your cell line and you stain it with a dye called Herxt, which is a DNA binding dye. Um, so essentially what the stem cells do is they have this MDR pump, this multi-drug resistance pump that essentially effluxes out the, the Herx dye. So you can see this population right here is actually the stem cells that have a decreased signal from the main population because it's fluxing some of that dye out. So what this investigator wanted to do is they wanted to confirm that they were indeed um, stem cells by looking at SCA1 um, on this population also. So the first slide we're going to do is we're going to take a look at all of the cells within this region, which is basically all of the live cells. So if we look at the SCA1 intensity of all of those cells, you can see there's a huge peak right here. About 96.88% of the events are negative for SCA1. I mean, if you, if you didn't even have these statistics, you can barely even see this kind of little blip down here of SCA1 positive cells. So now we're going to go back to that exact same slide and we're going to draw a gate around just what we think are the stem cells and then only look at those cells. And then sure enough, when you look at just the stem cell population, you can see that roughly 60% of the cells are now SCA1 positive. So gating is just an incredibly useful tool for, um, for looking at rare populations, but also just getting percentages of subpopulations of cells. Um, some important points in analysis. Um, so what kind of data are you looking for? Um, so are you looking for how much fluorescence? Are you looking for if something is five times brighter than something else or five times dimmer? Are you just looking to enumerate what percent are positive, what percent are negative? Um, what's the ratio between parameter one and parameter two? Um, so basically, a, a, a flow cytometer data file is just a string of numbers. So you can, you can pretty much do any statistics that you can do with a string of numbers. Um, you can look at for the mean of that population, percentages. CV is just the coefficient of variation, basically the standard deviation of how, how broadly distributed the data is. Um, median, um, again, anything that you can do with a list of numbers is basically what you do. Um, so now we're just going to close off with a handful of slides on the applications. Um, so you can see basically just a, a Medline search of um, flow cytometry. You know, it laid dormant from, you know, the beginning of when it was actually discovered till, you know, the mid-1980s. And it's essentially been an exponential growth of the utilization of flow cytometry, both in the clinical laboratory and in basic research. Um, so this is kind of a, a very you know, fairly extensive list of what can be done. We're not going to talk about all these. Um, but there is, which is why this presentation is hard, because I could really sit up here for like a day and a half talking about applications. It's a, it's a very, very, very... Um, broad um, discipline that gets anywhere from cell biology, um, immunology, I mean, it's just, it's, it's pretty diverse. Um, so the first very, I and mean, we've had a few slides on immunophenotyping, but it's not important really what these parameters are, but um, you basically stain cells with two different antigens, antigen A and antigen B, and you can see that here's a subset of cells, um, and then, you know, over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different populations um, just staining with two different parameters. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one of the, the key benefits is the, the multi-parameter, um, the high volume of cells that you can look at to look at very rare populations. In the clinical world, I mean, it, it used to be, you know, 10 years ago where, you know, a patient came in with leukemia. They would really not rely too heavily on the flow cytometric information, where now it's a key adjunct to um, the patient diagnosis, where oftentimes they won't even progress 
with kind of the diagnostics until they have certain um, flow cytometry data. Uh, for example, like a barren expression of um, like a T cell antigen on a myeloid leukemia is very prognostically important sometimes. Um, so it, it, it's gone from kind of, you know, not being very important to a key component in clinical analysis. Um, so this is the, um, I, I think that actually Roger Chien got a Nobel Prize recently for not this plate, but this kind of work. Um, so this is basically a it's, a, it's a bacterial agar plate with a whole bunch of different f um, bacteria um, expressing different fluorescent proteins. You've heard GFP and M cherry a couple of times. There's M tomato, there's, there's M whatever fruit you can pick. There's a CFP, like a cyan fluorescent protein. Um, but essentially, you know, by flow cytometry, you could then kind of harvest all these cells, enumerate them, sort them out to a purified population, um, whatever kind of manipulation you wanted to do with it. All of these are also visible um, by a flow cytometer. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there, there's functional assays as opposed to like phenotypically subdividing populations, like whether or not it's positive or negative for a particular antigen. Um, this is more of like a functional assay where, um, so you basically have control cells over here. So essentially this is again a GFP where it changes the emission of its, of its profile when it's in a, um, like an acidic environment. So control sample over here, treated sample over here, you can see that the cells have shifted up in this detector over here. And an overlay of the two, this is positive control, negative control, you can see all that, tell that these cells are um, reacting to this um, um, redox environment. So another um, functional assay, calcium flux. Um, calcium flux is a, is a key signaling component in a lot of um, post binding to a lot of different growth factors or whatever. Um, so essentially what you have is a dye called Indo-1 that, that emits around 500 nanometers when it's, when it's not bound to calcium, um, and it emits around 395 nanometers when it is bound to calcium. So you basically load the cells with Indo-1, and then this is just an ionomycin treatment where you kind of put the cells on the instrument, and you have this baseline kind of establishment of the ratio essentially between the calcium bound and the calcium free um, emission spectra. Take the cells off right here, you add the ionomycin, and you can basically watch the flux of calcium into the intracellular environment, and then you can slowly see the, the efflux of the calcium. Um, apoptosis, this is probably, at least in our lab, um, being a cancer center lab, this is one of the key assays um, that people want to be looking at. I mean, cancer biology is all about studying how cells are dying, essentially. Um, you want to force them into some kind of cell death. So this is actually looking at a Nexin-5, um, which, so phosphatidylserine is typically on the intracellular um, part of the plasma membrane, but when cells start to die, it actually reverses and it's expressed on the extracellular environment. Um, Mitotracker red here is a, um, a dye that basically labels polarized mitochondria according to the NERTS equation. So basically, um, for every 60, I think, megavolts of difference there is between the membrane, it incorporates tenfold more amount of the dye. So a polarized mitochondria is going to have a very high level of staining. And as you start to die, you depolarize your mitochondria. So some of that dye is going to be effluxed and your staining decreases in the same time, essentially, that your nexin 5 is being expressed on that extracellular environment. So you have live cells and you have apoptotic cells. Over here, this is just a staining of PI, which stains dead cells versus FLICA, which is fluorescent labeled inhibitors of caspase activation. So essentially, this is just a little compound that binds activated caspases and covalently binds to them, essentially um, halting the apoptotic process. So a live cell um, treated is basically going to go increase their caspase activation, and then they're going to start to become dead um, through their visibility with PI fluorescence. Um, so this is, yeah, just two different assays kind of, I mean, there's, there's uh, not hundreds, but there's definitely 30 to 50 probably assays just looking at different components of apoptotic death. Um, whether or not that's caspase activation, DNA damage, um, there's, there's just a whole slew of them. Um, cell cycle regulation um, is also another key component in cancer biology. Um, you want to know if the cells are, are replicating or dividing more slowly or more quickly um, after a particular drug has been added. So this is essentially looking at DNA content. So these are your G0 cells, and as they 
Um, so you stain them with PI, essentially, which is a stoichiometric um, DNA binding dye. So for every molecule of DNA, you have a certain amount of PI um, that gives a certain amount of fluorescence. And if you double the amount of DNA, you double the amount of PI bound to it, so you double the amount of fluorescence. So this is a linear scale here. So you can see that um, the G0 cells are right around, let's just say, 16,000. And your G2 cells, which have twice the amount of DNA, are going to be at right around channel 32,000. So this is a two-parameter plot, plot where we're looking at essentially DNA content versus cyclin A2, which is expressed in cycling cells. So you can see as they, um, so as they start to increase their DNA, they also increase the expression of A2. So you have your G2 um, cells over here and a little bit of mitotics. Um, again, this is the same kind of plot over here of DNA content versus a mitotic marker, phosphohistone H3, G0S, G2, and then specifically labeled mitotic cells. Um, so signal transduction. Um, this is actually some work within our lab, actually. So you take unstimulated peripheral blood, and as a, um, as a internal control, we're looking at the, the expression of phospho-ERK downstream from GMCSF stimulation. So you take peripheral blood from a patient or whatever, you add GMCSF, and then you look at the level of phospho-ERK um, about 10 minutes after the induction of GMCSF. And you can see that the lymphocytes have not moved whatsoever, but the monocyte population, which expresses the GMCSF receptor, has now increased the amount of phospho-ERK. Um, this is actually, I just threw this in after um, Dr. Lick's talk because it directly ties into one of the, um, the samples that he was talking about. Um, so CML, remember, that has that BCR rabel protein, and he was saying it upregulates um, signaling components. So it actually upregulates STAT5 expression in, this is a K562 cell line, um, which he also talked about. It just, it mimics the CML disease. So essentially, this is a K562 um, day zero untreated sample. And you can see that you have DNA content again down here, and then phosphostat 5 on this axis, where the untreated sample has constitutive levels of um, STAT5. And if you treat with that drug Gleevec, which binds the bcr able protein, you decrease the amount of STAT5 fluorescence back down to a basal level. Um, so uh, this is actually the last slide. So pretty much every, all the data that I've just shown you um, it's just for kind of um, acquisition. It's, it's, you know, what percent are positive, um, whatever kind of attributes you want to deconvolute the data with. Um, but you can actually sort out all of these different populations. So if you're interested in that random population that represents 0.001% of the events, you kind of just draw a gate around them, you throw them on a sorter, and you can actually sort them out. So remember I was saying that the cells kind of flow single file in this fluid stream. So basically what you do is you take that fluid stream and you break it up into tiny little droplets. Um, and this is obviously overly enlarged. And you're, on our typical sorter, on a, on a fast sort, we're creating about um, 98,000 droplets per second. So then you can have basically one cell in every one of these droplets. So the laser, I'm sorry, the, the laser is actually detecting the cells kind of you know, off screen here. Um, and the software says, oh yeah, that's a positive cell. So it waits until that positive cell is right down here, and then it sends a charge down this stream. So now when that cell and droplet is detached from everything else and floating in free air, it runs through some deflection plates and it actually goes purified into um, a collection chamber. So one droplet is equal to about you know, 0 0.001 microliters, sort rates up to 70,000 cells per second, um, I mean, this is a, an absolutely crucial component to a lot of cancer research. So if you had, for example, a cell line that you transduced with GFP to express a certain um, gene of interest, you obviously want to analyze only the cells that have that GFP vector. So they'll people will come down with their cell line, throw it on the instrument, we'll do a gate throw on the GFP positive cells, we'll give them back a population of 100% pure GFP expressing cells. Um, and there's, there's a zillion different applications for why. I mean, anytime you need a purified population to study, um, this is typically the, um, one of the easiest ways to get that done. Um, yep, that's about it. So that's a general overview of what flow cytometric analysis can do for you. Any questions? Or? Right. Has anyone used um, cytometry t to
to actually detect time-resolved differentiations of multipotent cells, say um, if you had a melanocyte or um, a blood stem cell to see how changes in its gene expression will affect the fate of the cell? Yeah, I guess I don't know what you mean by time resolved. I mean, so, so all flow sedimentric analysis is essentially a static measurement. So you have, you have a heterogeneous population in culture or something like that, but you're, when you throw it on the instrument, you're basically taking a snapshot of, of what it is. I mean, I, I think maybe what you're getting at is, is, the answer is probably yes, people will take a stem cell population, they'll put it in culture, and then they will phenotypically look at it um, on a flow cytometer at day zero, day one, day two, day three, and see if they're getting the desired phenotypic um, changes or maturation. Uh, I don't know if that answers. Okay. Um, how much sample preparation do you need, and how much time is a typical experiment? Yeah, I mean, it depends on, it depends on your sample. Um, I could take you and stick you in the arm and have your cells on a flow cytometer in about five minutes. Um, if you're looking in, you know, like a prostate tumor sample where you need to actually, you know, take a mouse and you have need to homogenize up the material, stain it with something. So, you know, it really depends on kind of what your starting material is. Um, I'd say the worst possible scenario is a couple hours, and that would be, you know, taking a sample that needs to be treated, like say with GMCSF stimulation, like that experiment. Then you need to fix the cells, you need to permeabilize them to stain intracellular um, antigens. Then you need to stain them, you need to, and there's washes. So that whole process is probably the worst case scenario in that you're talking, you know, a couple hours. And there. Um, can, can flow cytometer be used to analyze things other than cells, say microparticles or large liposomes? Um, yes and no. So, um, yeah, so microparticles is a, is a vastly developing field. Um, so essentially, it's, it's, it's all a matter of um, sensitivity. So, you know, this is part of the, what I was saying about you have just enough information to be dangerous right now. So um, in order to kind of turn on the electronics of an instrument, you have to have a pulse of a certain size. And typically that is, is triggered off of forward scatter intensity, so that's dependent on cell size. So obviously as you start moving down the scale of size of things, you're gonna have less and less signal intensity and you're gonna be closer to like a debris and you're, you're basically not gonna know the difference between electronic noise and real events. So, um, that's part of the answer. So if you're just based on, on kind of the, the size of the cells to be able to determine whether or not it's an event, um, you're running into problems right around 100 nanometers probably. Anything below that, it's, it's getting to be relatively difficult unless you do some serious purifying of the, the sheath fluid and some other different things you can do to the instrument. Um, however, you take those same particles that are now say maybe 50 nanometers and they're below the, the size threshold and fluorescently labeled those. So the great thing about fluorescence is you get such an amplification of your signal, right? So as a cell goes through the laser, you're getting a fluorophore sometimes, depending on the extinction coefficients and all that, that's being excited, you know, thousands of times. So you get, you know, one fluorescent component gives you a very large amplification of your signal. So if you can trigger on fluorescence, like label, uh, fluorescently label these small particles, that allows you to look at much smaller events. But yeah, actually this campus, the Evanston campus and all the nano development that's going on, these carbon nanotubes, all that kind of stuff, that's definitely an area where I think the technology is gonna go in the future. Um, and it's definitely something that we're actively pursuing. Uh, what if you wanted to just quantify the number of cells? Is that, um, is that done? And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's very easily done. I mean. Um, to get an absolute count, sometimes you need to have an internal control. So you basically add beads of a known concentration that then you can um, quantify the volume of the sample that you've collected. And then you draw a gate around your cells and you say, okay, I've collected 500 events in that region and I, knew, I know that I withdrew 500 microliters of my sample and then you have an absolute count. Um, but yeah, I mean, any kind of enumeration is, is very straightforward. 
So uh, is there any preference um, to choose live or uh, fixed cells when you try to detect a surface receptor protein? Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm always on the, the live cell um, side of things. So then you can typically, so you, you want to look at live cells, and then um, you'll usually use a dye like PI or DAPI to actually um, physically, well, not physically, but to gate out the dead cells. Um, dead cells are notorious for binding nonspecifically to antibodies. Um, so they can really wreak havoc on your data if you don't eliminate those. And then obviously if you fix your cells, you, don't, you no longer have that ability to differentiate between what was live and what was dead because they're all dead. So, I mean, if, if you can, run it live um, and then add one of those DNA dyes to kind of exclude your dead cells, for sure.